Welcome to Attracting Birds, Butterflies, Bees, and Other Beneficials. I'd like to thank the Berlin Cultural Council for funding this event, the Berlin Agricultural Commission for endorsing it, and for the Berlin Conservation Commission for hosting it. And so I, I begin every program with the acknowledgement that we live on land that was managed and inhabited before European colonization. Please take a moment to find your location on the map and honor those whose land we now occupy. So what are beneficials? Actually, this is a made up name. There is no such word in the dictionary, but uh, it's generally understood to be beneficial organisms, but beneficial to whom? And the question is organisms that are helpful to farmers and gardeners. Uh, so we are, we'll be talking about pollinators, uh, we'll be talking about predators, and we'll be talking about parasites. All three of them are beneficial to gardeners and farmers to, to keep their plants healthy and protected. So uh, let's start off with the birds, and they are beneficial in a few ways. They, uh, they're great at pest control because they love insects. Uh, seed dispersal is a vital role that they play in the ecosystem and uh, carry and clean up as well. And, and to a, a minor degree, for example, these two birds, hummingbirds and Baltimore Orioles, do a little bit of pollination, but they're not important pollinators. So uh, birds certainly inspire us. Everyone loves birds. Uh, artists paint pictures and take photographs and musicians are inspired by them. Uh, and uh, they're the most uh, popular thing to look, look for. <laughs> there are more birders than any other uh, group of naturalists. Uh, and you can uh, find your own Massachusetts bird, uh, your bird club in Massachusetts by going to that website at the bottom. Uh, the bird populations have declined at an alarming rate, 30% since 1970. Uh, two thirds of our birds could be gone by the end of the century. Uh, and birds are actually doing better, uh, um, which isn't saying much, but you know, the other vertebrates are faring far worse in terms of the biodiversity crisis. Um, the hab habitat loss is key uh, because so much land is taken by industrial agriculture, residential development, and commercial development. There's just not enough land left uh, in natural conditions for them to live in. Climate change is also a huge impact because of the habitat loss that climate change creates um, uh, to, the, to the land and you know the wildfires, the sea level rise, fl flooding, droughts, invasive species, species is a problem uh, due to climate change changes in vegetation and precipitation, loss of snow and ice. There's also new pests and diseases that are a byproduct of climate change, as well as disruptions in timing of migration, reproduction, breeding, nesting, and hatching of the food supply of these birds. So bird behavior may no longer be in sync with their food sources and other habitat needs due to climate change. Uh, agricultural pesticides kill 67 million birds in the US every year. Uh, so they can make birds anorexic, for example. Uh, please don't use any of these neonicotinoids. Uh, this is far worse than the DDT that Rachel Carson was sounding the, uh, the alarm about uh, in the mid 20th century. Uh, they should not be sold at all uh, and, and not be offered to either gardeners or farmers. Uh, window collisions kill up to a billion birds in the US every year because they see, uh, them, they see uh, a reflection of nature and they think that there's more trees out there or, or there where the windows are. Uh, so there are a number of ways that you can make your windows uh, appear otherwise uh, the, the, to be exactly what they are, you know, a barrier of some kind. Uh, and cats kill up to 3.7 billion birds in the U.S. every year. Uh, so we really should be keeping our cats indoors, uh, in, in part be, to uh, protect the cats themselves. Here are some uh, Red-tailed hawk, great horned owl, coyote, raccoon, all can prey on cats in addition uh, to other cats and dogs out there that might decide to, to uh, uh, confront them. <laughs> uh, so you can make a catio for your cat if you want them to have the experience of being out of doors, if you have the land and the resources. So please don't feed birds baked goods uh, because they contain preservatives, salt, sugar, and refined flour. They have little protein and no fat. Uh, and this is what happens when we feed bread to birds, this angel wing deformity that you see in this goose. So uh, here are some approved foods for songbirds, eggshells, they need the calcium. Uh, in particular, the, uh, the female birds when they are creating their eggs. Uh, ap bananas, apples, raisins, these, uh, these fruits are uh, often appreciated by birds. So are hard cheese, peas and corn. 
oats, squash seeds, pumpkin seeds, peanuts, any kind of nuts really. Um, now, as for the bird feeder, well, uh, you can imagine that this feeder could be easily soiled by the birds themselves. So it's not the ideal design. Uh, and so you can see that in, with these five homemade do-it-yourself bird feeders, only the one in the right upper right-hand corner and the one in the middle uh, would be considered safe in terms of uh, you know, making sure that it doesn't become soiled. Squirrel protection is a consideration for some people, uh, for many people. <laughs> and these, uh, these are some ways to do it, keep the squirrels at bay. Placement of feeders uh, is important for, their, for bird safety. You, you want the birds to be, um, uh, you don't want them, want the predators of birds to have access. So a metal pole that's eight feet long, buried two feet down, uh, and it's because it's hard for predators to climb that pole. And you, you see there's a baffle there as well, less than three feet from a window or more than 30 feet away. This is the 330 rule. Uh, you don't want it um, between three feet and 30 feet because the birds, uh, if they're startled by a predator, like by a hawk or something, they might just uh, crash right into the window or to the side of the, of the building in their attempt to get away. Uh, at least 12 feet away from vegetation that could harbor uh, a lurking uh, predator. Now it's okay to feed birds in the summer. You can see the Baltimore Oriole enjoying the orange there. Uh, uh, the uh, bluebird uh, is chowing down on those uh, uh, tender in, uh, bits of, of insect uh, larvae and uh, uh, rose-breasted uh, uh, grosbe grosbeak uh, is chowing down on uh, bird seed. So keep that seed dry. Uh, and uh, so you do that by filling the feeders halfway and refill, re refill it frequently to prevent mold. Uh, move feeders around because when the seed drops to the ground, uh, it can become moldy itself. Uh, and also clean that, those feeders regularly, wash every two weeks and rinse and dry before refilling if there's any way for the, for the bird seed to, to get soiled. And you can make your own suet. Uh, you heat the, these two ingredients, the suet and the, or the shortening and the peanut butter in equal quantities. Uh, you can mix with the dry ingredients, the cornmeal and the, and the uh, flour, uh, the six to one ratio of cornmeal to flour. Uh, and uh, the bird seed, nuts and dried fruit in there are optional. And once you've mixed that together, you pour it into the molds, whatever molds you have, empty tin cans or an ice cube tray, freeze them. And then uh, overnight, of course, that, that'll do the trick and they're ready to go and, and put in your suet feeder. Uh, you can make a homemade su suet feeder too, if you want to do a uh, search online for that. Uh, and here's some do-it-yourself bird baths at, uh, at no cost or low cost. Uh, and consider offering birds uh, a heated uh, bird bath that keeps the water uh, from freezing in the, in the winter because they do appreciate it then. Uh, and as for bird boxes, there, there are many different kinds of birds, of course, and they all have different needs in terms of uh, the bo bird box diameter, the, the floor, the box floor, the box height, the entrance height, the entrance diameter, and the placement height. All of those are different for different species of birds. Uh, and it was thanks to uh, the bird, uh, the bluebird bird boxes. And there was a campaign uh, more than a century ago because it looked like they were uh, be just becoming extinct. And people put up a lot of bluebird boxes and it worked. It helped them to regain their numbers. So every one of those birds pictured you can find uh, at this uh, website, uh, you can find uh, at the bottom of the page uh, instructions on how to attract that particular bird. And you notice that the uh, features of the bird box, which I think are quite interesting, the bottom, and there are three holes for uh, drainage. There are also holes at the top of the sides for ventilation. And there's even, there are even small shelves inside uh, of the front to enable the chicks to scramble up. Uh, and, and notice too, the hinges on the side, which enable you to open up that bird box and clean it at the end of the season. Uh, you want to place your bird box in the shade, offer the birds a clear flight path, uh, and keep them away from uh, uh, the, the entrance should not be in the uh, prevailing wind. Uh, starlings and house sparrows are non-native birds that do a lot of harm to our native birds, and they were brought here from Europe. And um, so they are unprotected by the state. You can harass them at will. Um, please do not 
offer brightly painted bird boxes because they attract the attention of predators. Also, a perch is totally unnecessary, and predators can use that perch um, to access the chicks. Uh, bird houses should be made of wood and nothing else. Uh, and they also should not be dangling from a string. They should be securely fastened to a pole, ideally. Uh, squirrel protection uh, can be an issue because squirrels uh, enjoy using bird boxes. All they have to do is, uh, you know, if, if there's no way to prevent them, they can just widen that hole. Uh, so you can uh, just put that, uh, that mount that uh, metal protector there. Predator protection. Um, if you mount a, a bird box on the tree, uh, there's, it's going to be hard to keep the, those uh, predators away. So a, a baffle or some, some device that protects that entrance uh, from predators is advisory. Uh, birdhouse cleaning should be done at the end of the year. Uh, use water and bleach, nine to one solution and, and scrub it. And you can put that bird box back up uh, and allow it to be there available through the winter because birds sometimes appreciate a bird box just as a place to roost, even if they're not nesting. In fact, you can make a roost box just for that purpose. And when birds are nesting, there are a wide variety of materials that they can use uh, to create their nests. And you can imagine uh, if, if, you, if there are any children in your life, uh, they, uh, they might really enjoy offering some of these uh, materials and watch to see if the birds come and help themselves. So birds need food, water, shelter, and places to rear their young like, like any animal. These are universal needs. And adult birds eat animal protein, uh, often insects, but other uh, small mammals or uh, vertebrates as well. Uh, they can eat seeds, of course, and fruit. Uh, sometimes even other botanical materials, such as flower buds, flowers, leaf buds, new leaves, grass shoots, etc. So they're, they, they're omnivores. Uh, they help themselves to whatever they can find, uh, but they have definite nutritional needs and it's the animal protein is essential uh, as, is the, as are the, the fruits for energy. So hungry chicks need caterpillars. They're the ideal baby food. And in fact, that, in order for that black cap chickadee mama to satisfy the needs of those chicks and, and fledge them, uh, she's gonna need to find 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars. Uh, for those hungry chicks. So uh, what that means is uh, we need to plant native plants that will attract the caterpillars and nourish them. Uh, as, uh, uh, as Doug Tallamy has uh, thoroughly researched and, and explained to, um, to us, the problem with non-native plants, that, and there are so many of them, about 70% of what we have in our landscape uh, in, in a typical suburban yard is uh, is non-native and those plants have defenses against uh, the caterpillars and you know that the leaves are simply inedible. The caterpillars haven't had enough time over the course of evolution to figure out how to eat them. Uh, they, they are quite familiar, however, with our native plants and they can use them for food. So caterpillars need native plants and migrating birds need native fruits. Uh, there's a study was done that showed that um, birds actually prefer uh, that the native fruits are more nutritious than the ones, than, for example, the more multiflora rose shown here, which is a non-native and um, a, a aggressive uh, invasive plant. Uh, and so birds will, will eat them if there's nothing else, but uh, when, when birds are migrating, they need uh, high quality food and the native uh, fruit offers that to them. So here is a list provided by allaboutbirds.org, which is the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology website. Uh, these are some of the birds that they feature. Mulberry is uh, a delicious fruit to uh, so many different kinds of birds. So if you plant a mulberry tree, just stand back and watch them flock to it. Uh, sassafras fruits are appreciated by birds, as are elderberry. Any of the viburnums, wild raisin, arrowwood, black haw, any of the dogwoods, gray dogwood, red osier dogwood, white dogwood. Spice bush is 50% fat, a wonderful uh, energy resource for birds. High bush blueberry and low bush blueberry. Uh, if you have blueberries, you know how much birds love them. Uh, and here's a plant that too few people 
have even heard of or tasted themselves. I, I think that June berries are absolutely delicious, probably just as good as uh, blueberries. And birds agree. So it's a beautiful uh, tree, a small tree uh, that uh, is just uh, gorgeous in all seasons. It's a great pollinator plant as well as a plant to attract birds. Uh, hawthorn is another tree species with edible fruits for birds. So is crab apple, uh, any of the wild cherries, black cherry and choke cherry. Uh, birds love them. And aronia, this is an ornamental black chokeberry uh, that uh, it doesn't, the, the fruit doesn't taste great if you pop it into your mouth from the shrub. But if you freeze it or uh, uh, cook with it, it's still absolutely delicious and it has more antioxidants than any fruit, including blueberries. So I highly recommend this from, for human consumption as well as for attracting birds. Uh, birds like blackberries, they like black raspberries, they like the fruits of staghorn sumac, uh, and throughout the winter, winterberry holly is available to them. This is a small tree. Uh, and of course, it's only the female trees, the ones that have the female flowers that then make the fruits, but so there need to be some male trees nearby, or at least one for the pollination to occur. Northern bayberry, here's another fruit that's available throughout the winter for hungry birds that are looking for nourishment. And uh, conifers offer seeds for birds and, and also uh, protection or a place to, to nest. And in fact, they the added benefit of uh, caterpillars that are uh, incredibly many, there are many uh, caterpillars that come to eat the needles of conifers. Uh, they don't seem uh, appetizing, but they are. So, uh, so here's uh, rounding out the list: Virginia creeper, uh, which, by the way, are poisonous to humans, but birds like them. Uh, either of these wild grapes, riverbank or fox grape, is edible to birds. And here's a sampling of the some of the species that will that are known to eat uh, wild grapes. Uh, and if you look up up these uh, this website for the Illinois wildflowers, they offer faunal associations, which uh, just as a way of fancy way of saying that here are the animals that are associated with these plants uh, in, you know, plant by plant, uh, which ones pollinate the plant, which ones come to uh, help themselves to the foliage or the fruits. That's a wonderful uh, resource. You can just learn so much about the plants in that way by going to this website. So uh, black eyed Susans have uh, leaves or rather seeds that the birds will eat because uh, you can see this as being a relative of sunflower and uh, so while the, the seeds aren't as large as sunflower seeds they're still edible. Uh, here's the a Maximilian sunflower. This is the a per, a perennial sunflower that you can establish uh, for birds. Purple coneflower is also a related plant again in the aster family and has edible seeds for birds. And here are more plants uh, and if, if you're uh, botanically uh, literate, if, you're, if you are familiar with the plant families, you'll see that every one of these, with the exception of sedum, is in fact a member of that aster family. So they all have edible seeds for birds. Uh, think about grasses also. Uh, they offer beauty to humans, uh, also uh, drought resistance, habitat for ground nesting bees, uh, protection from the weather for insects, protection from predators, food for larvae, food for birds over the winter and, and other times, and overwintering habitat for eggs, caterpillars, and pupae. Switchgrass is a beautiful grass. So is purple lovegrass. Little blue stem, big blue stem, broom sedge, Indian grass, wavy hair grass, and prairie drop seed. And there are also some sedges that will look attractive in your landscape and will provide benefits uh, uh, to, uh, if not to birds, at least to um, to insects and you know protect them. And, and anything that protects insects will, after all, uh, be an indirect benefit to birds, because insects are such a major part of their diet. So leave seed stalks standing over the winter, both to allow birds to feed on those seeds that are remaining, and to allow uh, the burrowing insects that are overwintering in them to be safe. Leave the leaves for the same reason that harbors the uh, you know, the larvae, that, the caterpillar that have dropped down from the trees is so especially under the trees, if you can le just leave those leaves under the tree canopy instead of raking them. Uh, and if you can't do that, well, rake them to some area where they will be, where they will provide habitat. 
Uh, brush piles are great for birds. They can find, uh, they can get protection and shelter in brush piles. They can also find a snack in there. Other insects that are, uh, or their, their, their food source. Leave dead trees and snags, both. Snags are, are good vantage points for birds to, to see, uh, to have a view of their surroundings and snags can be uh, nesting sites. So let's look at hummingbirds in particular. They are both predators and pollinators. Uh, Ruby-throated hummingbird is the only one that you're likely to see here in New England. Uh, and their numbers have actually increased over the years. So we don't need to be as concerned about them for conservation reasons, but people love to attract hummingbirds and hummingbirds love moving water. Uh, they also appreciate snags. Uh, uh, the, uh, the holes that yellow-bellied sapsuckers drill in, this, in these dead trees uh, will then uh, provide sap for the hummingbirds to help themselves and the insects that are attracted to the sap, the hummingbirds will appreciate those snacks as well. Uh, don't disturb their nests um, because uh, you know you might put your the, your human smell on the nest if you touch them, uh, and that will perhaps attract predators. Uh, the, the the bird won't abandon the nest, but or or just if predators notice that you're looking at the nest, they might be aware that there's something to look at there uh, because they're otherwise they're quite well camouflaged. It, but it is okay to rescue a hummingbird chick if you or that's that's true for any bird if you find a chick. And if you know where the nest is, you can, there's no reason why you couldn't put it back in. The, the bird will not reject it. Uh, welcome webs, because those hummingbird nests are made of spider silk. They, in fact, they are elastic nests. Uh, the elasticity comes from the spider silk. So they need that spider silk for, uh, um, to construct their nests. And if you decide to have a hummingbird feeder, this is an excellent model to have because it's easily clean. You can just unscrew uh, those two halves uh, and clean them and then screw them back on. Uh, and sugar water recipe is one cup water to one quarter cup sugar. No food coloring should be added. Uh, there'll be a, a red coloration on your, uh, uh, on your bird feeder, it's the hummingbird feeder itself. So you don't need to attract them with, with uh, red sugar water. So you heat the water and sugar uh, to, to dissolve it, refrigerate that mixer, use within one week or it'll go bad even in the refrigerator. Uh, replace that food in the feeder every few days and clean the feeder every three days because again, that, uh, that's sugar water, it's gonna uh, foul the, um, the feeder. So if the nectar becomes cloudy, it is spoiled and needs to be replaced, which can even happen in one day on a hot day. It might start to ferment. Uh, so cleaning, flush with hot water, scrub with a brush and do not use soap uh, because that's, uh, um, I guess, toxic to hummingbirds. Uh, black mold can also show up on bird feeders. And if that happens, you'll need to soak it in the dilute bleach solution, one quarter cup bleach to one gallon of water. Well, if you offer flowers, you don't need to worry about all those uh, uh, cleaning and uh, you know, you know, the, the first do no harm principle. Uh, it's impossible to do any harm by planting. Uh, although I will say that this trumpet creeper vine, you don't want to plant it near your house. You'll, you'll create problems. It's a very aggressive, vine and it might uh, do some damage to, to the structures of your house. So plant it well away from your house, but otherwise, and, and this is not even a native vine, I have to admit, but hummingbirds do love it. Uh, they also love this uh, trumpet honeysuckle, which is a native vine uh, and cardinal flower. Hummingbirds are attracted to the color red, beautiful flower for hummingbirds. Wild columbine is another one in the early spring. So is butterfly weed, uh, uh, even though it's not red. Uh, hummingbirds actually will be, uh, will check out a variety of different colors and, and if there's nectar there, they'll help themselves. Obedient plant is attractive to them. So is blazing star and anise hyssop, swamp milkweed, any of the phlox species. Purple coneflower is another one. So let's talk now about butterflies and moths, the lepidopterans, they are pollinators. They're not as efficient pollinators as bees because their bodies don't have, as, are not as hairy as bees, so they don't pick up as much pollen reliably. They, they do some, and in fact, uh, you know, some plants are uh, are attracting butterflies in specifically. But uh, interestingly, although butterflies are the species that we are most drawn to, there are many more moths than there are butterflies, uh, and both in terms of their numbers and in terms of the number of species. Uh, you can tell a butterfly from a moth because the antennae are are simple and club-tipped. Uh, 
uh, but while a moth and uh, moth's antennae are feather shaped. Usually butterflies are more colorfully, uh, uh, their, their wings are more, are more colorfully patterned, but uh, sometimes you can have some pretty beautiful moths as well. Butterflies make chrysalises, moths spin cocoons. Butterflies and moths, like birds, are in trouble. An almost 2% annual de decline in the last four decades is certainly not sustainable, uh, and we, we can't allow it to continue. Habitat loss, again, pesticides, again, and climate change, again, just like for birds. Uh, those are the causes. And, and this uh, study that was done in Germany uh, recent, uh, just a few years ago, uh, it was publicized that uh, more than 75% of the insects uh, had, had just vanished, you know, from these protected nature preserves in Germany. They were, they had been uh, trapping flying insects and, and just me measuring their weight for all those 27 years. And that short period of time, uh, they plummeted by 70%, 75%. So uh, that study got a lot of attention worldwide. Uh, and these kinds of statistics are being found uh, not just in Germany, but everywhere. Uh, so uh, butterfly gardening is a wonderful hobby to have. You'll probably want to uh, locate your garden where there's a decent amount of sun. Uh, near a water source is always helpful. Uh, providing shelter from wind is appreciated. Uh, those butterflies don't want to be blown around. Host plants will be, is essential because without those caterpillars, you won't get butterflies. Nectar producing plants uh, are required by the, by the adults uh, throughout their growing season. Uh, and organic landscaping practice is very important. You'll see butterfly boxes sold at uh, garden su supply stores. And it, I don't know why, because no one has ever found a butterfly in a butterfly box. It's someone's idea. Oh, this, they might, uh, you know, be, they might appreciate shelter during the rain. Well, they find shelter, I guess, in nature, but they never use these. Spiders might, or other insects, but butterflies never do. However, if you give them mud, that's something that, that they'll appreciate, especially the male butterflies. It's called puddling when they stick their proboscis into the mud and they sip in the, the, um, the, the water and the dissolved minerals and, and uh, they basically filter the water. It, uh, the purified water goes out the other end and they, and they uh, uh, hold back the minerals, which they then, when they mate with the females, they, uh, the, the minerals are, uh, give, give those eggs added fertility. Uh, so in order to give mud to butterflies, you can repurpose a bird bath and use gravel or sand. Uh, if it's sand from the beach, that, that will it contain the salt. Otherwise, you'll need to add the salt or the compost uh, so that they'll have the minerals that they need when they come puddling. And butterflies love fruit and they don't seem to mind it if the fruit is, is, uh, is turning. <laughs> so even if your fruit, uh, in, instead of composting the fruit, if it's butterfly season, considering just putting that fruit on a, out on a plate and see if, if, uh, if the butterflies come to feast. So once more, we need host plants for butterflies. Uh, and this uh, list of host plants shows that the woody plants, there's 21 woody plants listed here, 21 perennials on the right-hand side. But look at the numbers, 534 species of Lepidoptera, which are butterfly and moths, uh, will eat oak, leaves. And if you look at the end, you know, if you notice now at the end of the season where this is mid-October, it's impossible to find oak leaves that are not uh, at least partially eaten by some kind of insect, uh, by, by some larvae. So, uh, but even though oak takes first place, there's some other, a lot of other trees that are uh, real powerhouses in terms of providing uh, uh, edible leaves for, for uh, for, your, for caterpillars. And the one that I want to particularly point, point you out to, uh, point you to is number three, uh, willow at 455. The reason for that is the oaks and black cherries occur in our landscape pretty um, abundantly. Uh, oaks are, there's, there's a lot of oaks in our, uh, in, uh, uh, in our woodlands or uh, in, in most uh, municipalities. You'll find oaks, you'll find black cherries. They're almost like weeds, <laughs> they pop up. Uh, but willows is a different story. Uh, we don't have nearly enough willows and there's so many uh, species of Lepidoptera that will support them. Uh, so then if you turn your attention to the perennials, uh, look at those uh, 
the first the first four are all in that aster family goldenrods asters sunflower and joe pie or bone set and then the list continues all of these then uh, e even if there are a relatively few species uh, that that plant is going to be important to those few species that it does support so the name of the game is diversity on your property try to include both a quantity of plants um, you know, in biomass in particular is, is what's important, uh, but also a variety. So the, this beautiful spring azure butterfly, the, the larva uh, looks to these four different woody plants uh, for nourishment, New Jersey tea, dogwoods, viburnums, and meadowsweet, the leaves. Uh, leaves of violet are what the, this caterpillar can eat to become a great spangled fritillary. And isn't that an amazing photograph of those two photographs in the top center and the top right uh, of that, that emerging fritillary? Uh, only spice bush and sassafras leaves can satisfy the spice bush caterpillar, spice bush swallowtail caterpillar, which has fake eyes. It's not really looking through those things that look like eyes. They're really think of them as being painted on and being. Uh, the value of having uh, these false eyes is they they can uh, deter predators. They they look uh, they look fierce to a predator. So black swallowtail host plants include these members of the uh, carrot family: dill, parsley, queen anne's lace, fennel, and uh, either turtle head or plantain leaves are on the menu for the Baltimore checker spot caterpillar. And the monarch, as we all know, needs milkweeds. Here we have. This is the most charismatic of, of all butterflies, I would say, that people love monarchs and, and for good reason. I love them too. So uh, here the both stages of the, of the uh, metamorphosis uh, showing how the caterpillar just attaches itself and then sheds a layer to become the chrysalis and then sheds that layer, the outside layer to emerge uh, later on. And they're just amazing, you know, how far they, they're able to migrate. They use the sun and Earth's magnetic field to accomplish that in incredible task uh, before they end up uh, down in Mexico in, in uh, swarms. So plant milkweeds from monarchs. The common milkweed is the one by its, its common name, common milkweed, uh, will we'll let will inform you that yes, it is the most the one the one you're most likely to find growing in the wild. However, in your garden, I don't really recommend it uh, because it's uh, it's kind of a thug. It takes over. It it sends it sends out subterranean runners. So uh, if, unless you don't really care that it pops up everywhere, then go ahead and, and let it. But uh, most of us like to have a little bit more order in our gardens. And if you're one of those gardeners, uh, don't worry. You can instead pick the swamp milkweed or the butterfly weed. As the name implies, swamp milkweed um, can handle moist conditions. Butterfly weed, on, on the contrary, can handle dry uh, soil conditions, but either one uh, it will, will do fine in, in normal soil. Uh, swamp milkweed is, is good for the shade. So uh, caterpillars can eat any of these milkweeds as well. The, uh, the monarch caterpillars can eat them. Uh, here's, here are the numbers in terms of uh, you know, the trends for, for monarch populations. So uh, it's, it's been quite uh, of concern you know, that their, their numbers are dropping. And, Herbicide resistant crops are the main culprit. The use of glyphosate uh, by farmers means that uh, there just are so, there are nowhere near as many milkweed plants as there used to be. You can create a monarch way station and post a sign uh, proudly proclaiming that you're doing that. Uh, Monarchwatch.org will uh, send you one if you pay them uh, the, the fee that they charge, something like $25, I think. Uh, so here's a typical uh, monarch way station offered uh, by edibleterrace.com. So you'll see there are 12 different species. There's several individuals of each species. A, um, a couple of them are grasses, by the way, a drop seed and blue stem. So don't forget that's an important part of a pollinator garden. Um, and uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's not that difficult, really. You just, uh, it's just a question of finding the plants and uh, getting a, a dedicated garden space. Uh, that's in has a decent amount of sunlight, a decent amount of water available. But if you don't have the land, uh, you can even uh, make do with a con container gardener garden. The bigger container, uh, the better, because you can have more plants and it won't dry out as quickly. 
a butterfly bush is very popular with people and there's no question that it's popular with butterflies as well. It certainly draws them in. However, butterfly bushes are non-native and they're invasive. And because they're non-native, they don't help any caterpillars. The leaves are inedible to our caterpillars and they are becoming invasive. And I think will become more so as the climate warms. So I recommend it that you, uh, as, as much as you might love your butterfly bush, you might consider replacing it with a native plant. Uh, here are some native plants for nectaring butterflies and moths. Uh, sweet pepper bush is a shrub that draws them in. Uh, it's, a, it's a very vigorous shrub. It'll, it will uh, send out runners and just you know, form a colony. A New Jersey tea is a much more diminutive shrub and you can fit it in places where a uh, sweet pepper bush wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be appropriate. Um, milkweeds, as I mentioned, uh, not only for the, uh, not only are the leaves edible for the monarch caterpillars, but a variety of butterflies will come and nectar on that in addition to other insects. Uh, butterflies like comp compass plant, they like aster flowers, bone set, joe pie weed, purple cone flower, blazing star, thistles. I saw a giant swallowtail on a thistle this year. It was so, so exciting. I'd never seen one before. Uh, now, Mexican sunflower is a non-native and it's, a peren it's, not an, it's not even a perennial, it's an annual. You don't have to plant it every year, but there's no question that butterflies are drawn to it. And it's, it's not really harmful to plant a few non-natives here and there. Uh, Zinnia is also in that category of a non-native, but it's, it's, it's not invasive. So uh, uh, and butterflies certainly enjoy them. Uh, now let's talk about bees because they are the best pollinators. They have the hairy bodies that pick up pollen and, and transfer it to other flowers much more efficiently than any other pollinator. Interestingly, flies are number two as, as being the best pollinators, uh, but, but bees take first, first prize. So uh, here's a small sample. We have more than 400 different kinds of native bees here in Massachusetts. 80% uh, of plants need pollinators uh, and one third of our food is pollinated and much of that is pollinated by honeybees uh, and other bees. Pollinators make a difference. Uh, the fruit on the left was pollinated by an insect actually delivering that pollen. Um, the, uh, the one in the middle uh, only received pollen indirectly uh, or, or rather didn't uh, only received its own pollen. The one on the right did a little bit better but not much better. It got some wind pollen as well. Uh, but no insect was able to, uh, wind-borne pollen, but no insect actually delivered it. So you can see how important those pollinators are to getting decent crops of fruit. So here it is, the champion honeybee, or the one that, and anyway, uh, the most charismatic bee, the one we, most people are familiar with, and it's, but it is a, it's a non-native bee. Britain, uh, Brit, British colonists, uh, colonists brought this bee over in hives uh, four centuries ago, they wanted the, the honey and wax that they could get from beehives. Uh, so they make honey, they pollinate crops. Uh, this is uh, what a, a wild colony looks like, but there aren't that many in the wild these days. Most, most of the time, if you see a honeybee, you can be pretty sure that it came from someone's hive. Uh, honeybees live in managed colonies. There's a queen right in the middle. Uh, and often uh, it's a big business. You, uh, crops uh, need, that need honeybees uh, will pay uh, the beekeepers to bring the bees to them when, they're, when the flowers are in bloom and, and need their services. Uh, so here is a, a poster of native bees, as I mentioned, about 400 different species. Um, honeybees are effective competitors with, uh, with, our, with the native bees because they are numerous. They are, uh, there's about 10,000 in a, per hive. They're generalists, they can feed on so many different kinds of flowers. They're effective foragers, so they move pretty quickly from one to the next. They're able to exploit non-native flowers, so they're, they're, this problem of competition is actually greater in landscapes, that, in landscapes where non-native plants dominate. Uh, and another problem is that honeybees can carry and spread viral diseases. They can leave the virus on the flowers, and then when a native bee comes to and visits the flower, they can pick up that, uh, that virus. So uh, while honeybees are certainly important to uh, well, to beekeepers and to, and to farmers, um, they, they also have pose problems and, and should not be uh, allowed in uh, nature preserves, for example. Well, if, uh, if, you, wanna, if you are a beekeeper or know, some, or know someone who is, you might want to suggest that they go in this direction of being organic and natural. 
uh, for all the reasons stated here, uh, or, uh, in, or by, by these methods. So using natural chemicals, in the, uh, monitor colony size, remove old frames, selectively breed for disease resistance, harvest honey sustainably, offer ample forage. And if you really want to uh, do, do it the right way or the, the, the way that was proven by a fellow named uh, Emile Waret, he was a, a, a French monk, Abbe Waret, uh, back in the 50s, he, after years of study and research and experimentation, he determined that this uh, hive that, that has been called the Waré hive uh, is, the, is the best design for uh, hands-off beekeepers, uh, treatment-free bee, bee, beekeeping and, and, and keeping them healthy. A simple management by the box rather than by the comb, lighter boxes, optional windows, and their foundations. So uh, check out the Waré beehives if, if, you, if you're a beekeeper. Uh, now, bumblebees are all native bees, um, and uh, they uh, they are colony. Uh, they they start colonies uh, just like honeybees do. There's the queen who lays the eggs, and she has to do all the work herself uh, for the first few weeks until those eggs uh, hatch, and and she has helpers uh, that that can tend the brood, uh, and then. It will look like that, but it, it's it's never as large as a honeybee hive. There's only hundreds rather than ten thousand um, in a hive. Uh, bumblebees are great at buzz pollination. Tomato flowers, for example, uh, do not have pollen on the outside of the anthers. They're they're inside, and they uh, they can only be be released through the pores at the terminal tips of those anthers. And bumblebees know just what to do. They hang on to the the anthers. They they uh, vibrate. Uh, the flower at just the right frequency so that the pollen is dislodged and, and lands on their bodies. And you see the uh, these large corbiculae, they, they are, they're called um, on the hind legs that are they're gathering pollen in those pollen baskets. Also you'll see in the lower left, uh, beekeeper services are, uh, or uh, honeybees, excuse me, bumblebees are, are kept in boxes by uh, people who are growing, uh, farmers who are growing tomatoes because they are such great pollinators. Of the tomato flowers, and there are other uh, plants in that same family: the the uh, eggplants, the peppers, uh, potatoes, and other bumblebee pollinator pollinated crops include raspberries, cranberries, blueberries, strawberries, and uh, cucumbers. Turtlehead is an example of a wildflower that only bumblebees can pollinate because no other bee is strong enough to to force its way into that uh, uh, that flower and uh, I, I have turtle head that's blooming even now, the, the pink turtle head in, in mid-October. Uh, bottle gentian is another one that only bumblebees can access. This flower never opens more than you see it uh, in that, in that uh, form. Uh, so it can force its way into that flower and, and uh, help itself to the abundant nectar that it'll find there. Uh, bumblebee population, uh, uh, well there are a couple of species that are doing quite well. The bum bombus by maculatus and the bombus impatiens. You see those gray uh, bars that indicate the later time frame, the 2004 to 2006. But uh, back in the 70s, there were some bumblebees that were fairly common and, and now we hardly have any of them. So uh, what's important then is to help out those bumblebees that, uh, that are not so abundant. Here, so here are the ones that you're most likely to find. Here, these are the ones that are more numerous than now back in the 70s, the two-spotted bumblebee and the common eastern bumblebee. Uh, but the rusty patched is, is gone from New England, is endangered elsewhere, and American bumblebee is also threatened. So it's, it's, the, it's the ones that are at risk that we really need to be uh, tending to. And, and there's a fellow named Rob Jagir, that last name is G-E-G-E-A-R, uh, who's a UMass Dartmouth uh, professor, and he publishes lists of pollinator plants that these that, that the at-risk uh, pollinators need. Leave abandoned mouse and bird nests for bumblebees because that's uh, uh, they can then uh, make their they, they can't bring ma nest material into a cavity uh, like birds can. So they, they depend on finding nests that are already uh, suitable. And leave it be landscaping is uh, is appreciated by bumblebees and so many other life forms. So Sweat bees are one of the ground nesting bees. 70% of our native bees are ground nesting. 
Uh, and they're, these are fairly small bees. They're called sweat bees because they're attracted to our perspiration, but they're per totally harmless. You don't need to worry about them. They're, they don't have a colony to defend. Uh, and that's usually uh, honeybees are only, uh, honeybees and bumblebees are only really dangerous in most cases when you threaten their colony. So these are solitary ground dwelling and generalists that a remarkable variety of flowers that they can visit and, and uh, benefit from. Uh, collecting the pollen from those flowers. Uh, here's a remarkable ground dwelling bee. It's called the plasterer bee, also the cellophane or carpen or polyester bee. The mother, uh, when she uh, uh, creates those holes in the ground, she's actually able to uh, line the nest, uh, line that cavity with something that resembles a plastic bag. And then she uh, leaves her uh, the the food, the uh, liquid food down there, uh, which is a combination of pollen and nectar for the egg, uh, attaches the egg, egg to the side of the wall and then seals that plastic bag. And when the egg hatches and has uh, developed to mature bee, it can just chew its way out of the plastic bag and emerge in the spring. Uh, so in providing habitat for ground nesting bees, uh, you might want to offer a, an area of, that's several yards across. Uh, loose well-drained soil is best. And if you can't find that, you could even create a nest box or a ground, ground nesting box for bees um, that has half soil and half sand. Uh, flat areas or earthen banks are work well. You, uh, a sunny location that's south facing, a soil filled planter can even be helpful. And stay off the area that you have designated for the ground nesting bees so they're not disturbed. Grasses can also offer protection. Uh, the, the, ground, the, the soil underneath the grass uh, it will, will be a place where they can burrow into the ground. Now the blue orchard mason bee is loved, uh, much loved by orchardists because they are so amazingly efficient at pollinating those uh, flowers. And also you'll see the, this uh, mason bee on the upper right, that's a blueberry flower. Um, the reason they're so efficient is that they are much more likely to go to a different tree uh, and carry that pollen, you know, rather than staying on the same tree and just going to one flower after another after another on the same tree, which does no benefit to the plant whatsoever. Uh, the plant needs pollen from a different tree, and that's what the, a mason bee is much more likely to, to uh, go from one tree to the next. So, uh, and mason, mason bees, as the name implies, need mud. There you see a, a mother bee carrying uh, that mud and create, it, it creates chambers. Now you'll, you'll see in this photo here, I, I believe those are sections of bamboo. Some people actually offer these chambers to mason bees. I do not recommend that you use bamboo because bamboo is, uh, uh, does, does not breathe well enough. So uh, it's much better to use uh, native plants that, uh, that will be appropriate for, for nesting, uh, cavity nesting bees. Uh, another cavity nesting bee is this leafcutter bee. And as you can see, they're, they are amazingly uh, accurate in the ways that they can just cut a perfect circle of a, a, a leaf blade. Certain, uh, and there are certain leaf blades, a certain species of leaves that they prefer. And uh, she'll just uh, roll up that circle, circular leaf blade uh, section and insert it into the cavity where she's going to be uh, laying her egg and, and uh, providing the, the, uh, the bee bread for that egg uh, and it'll seal up and she'll seal off that uh, leaf chamber. Uh, so here are some of the leaves that leaf cutter bees can use. Um, lower right, you'll see a rose bush, uh, uh, leaves from a rose bush. And you can imagine that some people are not too happy, but uh, when they see these perfect circular holes cut, but you really should rejoice when you see them because then you realize that uh, you're, you're benefiting su such a, an important uh, bee species, the leaf cutter bees. Uh, and it won't, it, it really won't harm your rose plants. But they'll do just fine. Uh, so uh, po crops pollinated, pollinated by leaf gutter bees include blueberry, onion, carrot, and uh, alfalfa. Uh, so uh, that, this top row, uh, in this case, uh, 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 holes were drilled in, uh, in a piece of woods, allowing those um, uh, different kinds of bees to uh, lay their eggs and uh, the upper, upper row is the leaf cutter bee, uh, so showing several different leaf cut, uh, leaf, different chambers that it's created with its uh, leaves. Uh, the rosin bee in the middle, rosin was used by, by those bees. And then the mason bee that used mud 
for its larvae. So here are some of those stems that I mentioned of, of wild plants that can be used. And some of the uh, stems are already hollow because that's what certain species of cavity nesting bees need. Other cavity nesting bees, however, need to find stems that they themselves will hollow out. So it, uh, it's always good to have a variety of plants for a variety of purposes uh, when, you're when you're landscaping for pollinators. And the native plants for native bees, uh, uh, a list was created that showed which ones are the best native bee magnets. And first place is wild bergamot because it attracts 15 different species uh, or 15 different native bee genera. You know? So uh, each, each genus of course can often have different species. So wild bergamot attracts 15 different genera. I'm not sure how many different species that would uh, figure out to. A very popular member of the mint family is closely related to bee balm. In second place, attracting 14 native bee genera, black-eyed Susan. In third place, bone set, attracting 13 genera. And then tied for, for fourth place, swamp milkweed and butterfly weed. We've already met them. Swamp tick seed and oxeye sunflower, two more members of the, ast of the aster family, mountain mint and blue vervain. A word about mountain mint one of my favorite uh, pollinator plants. Uh, just a, an amazing assortment of pollinators will come visit uh, these flowers, including uh, wasps that you didn't even know existed. Uh, and you don't need to worry about those wasps, by the way, because they, uh, they are only likely to harm you if you disturb their uh, nests, which is the same as is the case for the honeybees and the bumblebees. Another wonderful thing about mountain mint, besides its popularity with uh, with pollinators is that you can use it to uh, repel mosquitoes, simply crush the, the leaves and apply it to your skin. Uh, mosquitoes hate the smell of mountain mint and it'll keep them away. And going down the list, attracting 11 different genera, we have foxglove beard tongue, uh, cup plant in New England, aster, two other members of the aster family, and golden alexanders, which blooms in the spring. Big leaf aster, wild geranium, and yellow coneflower, a very different ty types of plants. Wild geranium is a small, low growing plant. Yellow coneflower is much taller. Uh, then uh, attracting nine different native bee genera, Anis hyssop, very popular with pollinators. Purple coneflower, Jacob's slatter is a, a small, low growing plant, good, good ground cover. Ohio spiderwort, uh, ironweed, a tall, uh, stately plant, beautiful, and culver's root that can. Uh, also put on quite a show. Uh, eight different genera, harebell, and seven genera, wild lupin and bloodroot, uh, round out the list of these native bee magnets. And of course, there's so many others that are important to them as well. Uh, Kathy Neal has created this wonderful list uh, of, of uh, flowers, a, a, cal a flowering calendar uh, for native pollinator plants. And it shows the color of their bloom. So for example, Golden Alexanders is the first one uh, that shows up, it's, it's blooming first. And it, so it shows the number of weeks and which particular weeks that, that it's in bloom. Uh, so in planning your pollinator garden, you want at least three species that's in bloom at all times. And a list like this can help you uh, when you're doing your shopping or plant acquisition. And there are a variety of ways to do that other than shop. If you know uh, any friends who have these plants, your friend probably would be able to give you seed or uh, you know, do, do divisions of their extras and, and uh, help you get started. Now, purple coneflower, uh, the, the native species, is, uh, is the one in the upper left corner, but uh, plant breeders have created at least 100 different cultivars, and three of them are pictured here. The problem with them, for example, double delight, well, there's no nectar and pollen in them whatsoever. Uh, green jewel, uh, pollinators don't even recognize it as a flower. And even, even the Magnus, which looks somewhat like the original, is just not as good uh, the, as the original. There's, because all, some, many of these cultivars, there's less nutrition than there is with the straight uh, wild species. There's less genetic variation because they have been bred uh, for a particular reason, just for, for, our, for appearance sake. And, and often there's no other reason they've been uh, for, for creating the, the uh, particular cultivar. Uh, so they can be more more vulnerable to pests and diseases with that low low variation. 
they may not be open pollinated or, or they may not self seed. Uh, and they might be less adapted to local soils and climate, so it can be a difficult to even grow them. Uh, and furthermore, they can distract pollinators from visiting the wild plants. We want the pollinators to be serving the wild plants because the plants, after all, uh, are what the wild pollinators, the wild bees and such, are depending on. And finally, they might hybridize with our native species, which affect the survivability of that native species. Now, here are your standard uh, non-native ornamentals, uh, including the tulips and daffodils uh, and the bleeding heart. Consider, though, that uh, there is a native bleeding heart, the wild bleeding heart that you see on the right. And I would say that it's much more attractive than the old, than the cultivar that's called old fashioned that you see on the left. I can understand why it was created as, uh, you know, the novelty and the, the contrasting colors. But to me, the, the subtle uh, beauty of the wild bleeding heart, just, uh, you can't improve on it. It's just beautiful the way it is. Also, because, uh, you know, beauty is in, in the eye of the beholder. And because I know the wild beating heart is a native plant, that's the one that I want to see. And that's the one I'm just, I have a greater fondness for. Uh, here's some more spring ephemerals that are native alternatives to those uh, tulips. And uh, they're not, not quite as showy, but then, then again, beauty is an eye of the beholder. Uh, and, they, and they can, they certainly have a spectacular beauty of all of their own. Uh, now, I mentioned that 70% of our landscaping is, is non-native plants, and many of them are non-bee plants. Pansy, uh, daylily uh, is just not particularly attractive to pollinators. There's nothing in a, in a rose that, uh, to offer. Uh, same, same situation for double marigold. There's no pollen, no nectar. Petunia, New Guinean patience, begonia, peony, uh, even for Scythia, which is so popular, but there's, there's no floral resources there. Uh, it's just a, a food desert as far as the pollinators are concerned. And hosta, well, bees will visit it and they do get some nectar rewards, but still I would rather uh, plant uh, native plants. And here are some alternatives to hosta that are also shade tolerant. And, you, and the first six on this list are all good ground covers. Uh, so they, uh, ground covers are, are helpful. Uh, they're, a palm, they're a gardener's friend, you know, keeping the weeds at bay. And now because uh, the predators and parasites are among those beneficials that uh, we, just, we defined earlier as being uh, helpful to gardeners and farmers, let's take a look at them. Spiders will prey on everything possible. They're generalists. And so will praying mantises. So uh, while, while people actually you know, promote and, and will, you, know, you can buy praying mantis egg cases, but they're really not the best predators out there because they'll eat anything, uh, what you want, to encourage is the, um, is the ones that are targeting the pests. So lace wings are great. That's just lace wing larvae, as you can see in the upper right. That's the larva that's attacking the mealybugs, the spider mites, thrips, aphids, and caterpillars that can be pests in your garden or pests to farmers. Lace wings are beneficial. Here's a lace wing hotel that you can make just by rolling up a piece of cardboard and putting it in the uh, plastic bottle that where the bottom has been cut off and is hanging in there. Ladybugs, it's the larvae again that are the uh, efficient predators of aphids, mites, and mealybugs. But you notice the adult is pollinating, right? The ladybug itself that we're familiar with is pollinating a flower. And there's quite a variety of ladybugs out there. And here's a hotel for a ladybug, just a, a mesh bag with pine cones. Fireflies are much less numerous than they used to be. Their prey is insect larvae, snails, and slugs, so they are beneficial predators and offer them low hanging trees, forest litter, long grasses. They like ponds and streams. Don't use fertilizers or pesticides in your landscape. And please turn off your outdoor lights because it confuses uh, fireflies. They're, after all, they, they need to find each other, not an outdoor light. Uh, assassin bugs are very efficient predators as well. So are hoverflies or surfid flies. Uh, and again, it's the larvae, but notice these uh, adult surfid flies are pollinators, just like the ladybug. Trichogramma wasps, tiny little uh, wasps that lay their eggs in the eggs of much larger insects. And uh, of course, kill, it will kill that uh, egg. So, it, so they are uh, effectively predators. Uh, 
a variety of species, and so are the ichneumon wasps. There's, there's an astounding number of different species of ichneumon wasps that will attack a, an incredible number of lists, and you see it here, all the different pests that uh, these wasps are effective at, um, at parasitizing. Uh, the photo in the upper right, you can see a, a caterpillar that's uh, heavily infested uh, with, uh, by, by a wasp that you know, laid many eggs on that caterpillar and they're all sprouting <laughs> out of the skin, you know, the, those, those eggs. Uh, flowers for predators and parasites. Well, the, the, the uh, plant family called Apiaceae, uh, kind of a funny name. Every, every plant family, by the, by the way, ends with E-A-E-A, -E -A, or uh, actually, uh, you know, that it, it's, it sounds like E-A-E-A -E -A, uh, when, you, when you say it as well, Apiaceae. So here are three members of that family, the carrot family, uh, that, are, that have a, appealing flowers for these parasites. Uh, and here are four from the aster family, four more from the aster family, boneset, yarrow, coreopsis, uh, uh, horse mint, bugleweed, wild bergamot, and anise hyssop in the mint family, Lamiaceae. We'll also draw in those parasites. So uh, when, you, when we talk about natural control of gardener, garden pests, there's a term IPM, integrated pest management, and why not think of it as intelligent pest management? Because after all, why would you want to harm the very insects that are your allies, the predators and the parasites? Uh, you certainly wouldn't want to uh, use general, uh, you know, uh, broad spectrum uh, yeah, insecticides where you're harming them. So instead, you can simply uh, put a, a barriers over your crops that uh, will allow the the water through but won't allow the insects in. Companion plants uh, are helpful or can be. Hand picking can be an, an option, just picking those pests off and using organic pesticides um, when necessary and, and, if, uh, and if you do it responsibly. Uh, so uh, trees and shrubs for pollinators of all kinds. Now we're looking at, uh, remember, uh, we, we have the butterflies, we have the bees, we have the pollen, the, the the flies, all of them, uh, these are trees and shrubs. And we don't even normally think about trees and shrubs when we think about pollinator plants. We think about wildflowers. But you, you couldn't ask for a better pollinator plant than a willow tree. Uh, and remember, willow is a top host plant for caterpillars. So the leaves of that, of that tree are, are very beneficial uh, for caterpillar populations and, and therefore beneficial for birds as well. But when they bloom in the spring, uh, and it's they're they're blooming in in, uh, in the early spring when there's not much out there for the bees to help themselves to, or the bees or other insects, a wide variety of insects that come visit these these pollen uh, these uh, willow flowers, uh, a very vital source of nourishment. And and think also about how trees and shrubs, because they're bigger, they have a lot more flowers than wildflower than herbaceous wildflowers do. So. When you think about pollinator plants, think about trees and shrubs first. And if you have room on your property, uh, please establish as many of them as possible. The name of the game, after all, again, is maximizing your um, biomass of native plants on your property. And because that's what's most helpful to the wildlife. Redbud, a beautiful tree, is also blooming in the spring and appreciated by pollinators. Basswood. Likewise, uh, a magnet for bees, fruit trees are pollinated by pollinators. Uh, American plum is a native plum, and so is beech plum. Juneberry, uh, one of my favorite plants, as, uh, and I mentioned it uh, before in the list for um, attracting birds with the fruits, but they're also pollinated plants, as are most of the other trees and shrubs that were in that list for attracting birds. Virginia rose and Carolina rose, for example, high bush blueberry and low bush blueberry, any of the dogwoods, and this plant called nine, this shrub called nine bark, pollinator magnet. Uh, please don't buy the cultivar with the uh, purple leaves. Instead, go with the green leaves because they can be eaten by the nine bark leaf beetle. The nine bark leaf beetle cannot eat the purple leaves. Uh, and the winterberry holly, not only is it available for birds, but it's also a good one for pollinators. You can. Uh, Plant native hydrangeas, the panicle 
hydrangea or smooth hydrangea, if this is uh, to your liking. And the mountain laurel, such a beautiful shade tolerant shrub. Butterflies love it. Consider also that if you grow culinary herbs and allow them to flower, basil, chives, rosemary, oregano, lavender, the pollinators will uh, eagerly come and, and help themselves. And think about the ground covers that are, uh, you can consider them to be living mulch because they're keeping the weeds at bay. Uh, wild strawberry, is, it's a very high value host plant as well as um, its function and, and the pollinator plant uh, as well as its function as a ground cover. Creeping phlox, bearberry and loves the sun, gold star, barren strawberry, golden ragwort. These are all great um, uh, ground covers. Wild geranium, pussy toes uh, in the shade, uh, made in the shade, Allegheny pachysandra, a native pachysandra, and wild ginger can do remarkably well in the shade. Foam flower and coral bells, uh, again in the shade, uh, appropriate as a ground cover. So before, uh, before you even begin your, your uh, planning your habitat, you have to do an inventory of your invasive plants. Know them, find them, make a realistic plan for controlling or eliminating them and follow through with that plan. And you need to know which they are. So Japanese knotweed is a, a real bane. And uh, uh, only, only way to get rid of it uh, other than chemicals, which, uh, can sometimes be called for it. Uh, glyphosate, I think, is, is a, a legitimate um, way uh, and a safe way to get rid of Japanese knotweed. Uh, but you can also just re repeated cutting, but you really have to be quite vigilant to do it that way or cover it with plastic for uh, a hard black plastic for a you know, tough, thick uh, barrier for a long time before those roots finally give up. Oriental bittersweet, please cut any bit bittersweet vines that you find that look like this uh, at the base so that they can't make more fruits and, and uh, which the birds will eat and spread. Uh, and if possible, dig them up before they have a chance to get up to the tree because they can kill trees and take them down. Uh, Multiflora rose is a terrible invasive shrub that has just claimed a lot of territory. Uh, bush honeysuckles, these Asian honeysuckles are another uh, burning bush, goutweed and uh, garlic, mustard, and black swallowwort, those three are all uh, herbaceous plants and they come up, they pop up a lot and, are, and cause problems, uh, just claiming space that we could otherwise be uh, planting native plants. So, uh, and autumn olive is a shrub that's quite uh, a, a common invasive plant. Now, poison ivy is not an invasive plant, it's actually a wild plant. And there's no need for you to get rid of it unless you're concerned about people making contact with it. Otherwise, consider it to be a food source for birds if it actually is in the woods um, it, and is able to climb up a tree and uh, send out and create flowers and then those white fruits that the birds can eat. Uh, we can't eat them, but the birds can. Uh, but you're, you're certainly, uh, it's understandable if you want to get rid of it on your property wherever you have a garden or that kind of thing. And the way to get rid of any unwanted vegetation, if it's a patch of poison ivy or, or your lawn or what have you, uh, just smother it. And if you put down sheets of cardboard, overlap them, or you can buy builder's paper and just roll it out. Uh, or you can use newspaper, but if you use newspaper, it should be seven thicknesses, six or seven thicknesses of newspaper, and overlap them as well. And then put something on top to keep that, uh, that barrier layer uh, uh, in place and to make it look more attractive. But also, uh, you're, uh, if you want to add fertility, you can add some compost. Otherwise, just add mulch, and you may not need extra fertility if you're doing a wildfire garden or if you're establishing trees or shrubs. You might just uh, just need to mulch it uh, and and trust that the uh, the parent soil will be uh, fertile enough. So the, here are the benefits of mulch: it suppresses weeds, it keeps the soil moist, it keeps the soil cool, and it enriches the soil. Uh, so annual beds, your traditional. A vegetable garden, you can use grass clippings, straw, shredded leaves, or pine straw. Leaves and pine straw can also work for perennial beds, but they're going to, uh, shredded leaves are going to um, decompose fairly quickly. But pine straw, also known as pine needles, is an excellent mulch for either annual or perennial beds. Uh, and it's, it's a myth that pine straw makes the soil acidic. It does not. It, uh, it actually doesn't decompose uh, uh, very readily at all. And when it finally does, uh, it does not change the, the pH of the soil. 
pine bark, sawdust, wood chips, and chip branch wood are also great. Uh, uh, wood chips are, are quite commonly used in perennial beds. Chip branch wood is is uh, uh, is is not just the, not, uh, not the wood from the trunk, but wood that's gotten uh, uh, by chipping the branches and even some of the leaves and the twigs, uh, and and the slender branches. Chip branch wood is actually an, a wonderful uh, nutrient. Uh, dense um, mulch because it has uh, a lot of the uh, uh, nitrogen along with the carbon. Uh, mulch smart, don't use dyed mulch. It's often contaminated with creosote and CCA and that's not good for the plants. Uh, you should not mound the mulch around a tree. That's, uh, it's just bad practice for the, you know, the tree might uh, uh, be infected that way. Uh, and also when that mulch decomposes, you'll have exposed roots. So the properly mulched tree uh, the mulch doesn't even touch the trunk. Uh, and here's a rain garden uh, that perhaps mulch was used at the beginning, but now the plants are have taken over and there's no need to add, add more mulch because the, the plants themselves are keeping the soil mo moist, keeping the weeds at bay, uh, keeping the soil cool. Uh, and consider that the, that the cheapest way to get a lot of plants is growing them from seed. You can gather seed in the wild, you can order them from a Wild Seed Project in Maine. Uh, and uh, which is also a great website to go to to learn how to germinate the seed. Many wildflower seeds need a period of cold treatment. So if you put them in the refrigerator, which is ideal temperature for a specified length of time that the instructions will tell you for each seed packet, uh, and, then, um, and then they'll be ready to pot out uh, using a potting so uh, some a potting soil mixture, could have vermiculite, uh, sand, uh, uh, or actually, the, the, uh, excuse me, the, uh, when you're doing the cold treatment, when you're putting them in a plastic bag, uh, you, want to, you don't just put the seeds in the bag, you put something that's moist in with the seeds to keep the seed, seeds moist and vermiculite sand or moist paper towel can all serve that function. So here are three different uh, uh, resources to learn more about growing native plants from seed. You could also buy plant plugs. When you buy really small plants like this, you can get a lot for a, a, at a, a very reasonable price. Uh, and you'll also, you also have assurance that each one of those plants is a unique individual, genetically unique individual. You don't have that assurance when you buy large plants. They could all be cloned. Uh, sometimes when you want to have uh, more, more of a given species and you don't mind them being clones of each other, uh, you can separate them. This is a, a separation that I did of a swamp milkweed. Uh, and uh, one clump became four individuals that each had their own root system. Layering is another way to get more individuals from a parent plant. Just if you bury the plant in soil uh, and then it, that stem becomes root and then you can cut it from the, from the mother plant. Cuttings are a remarkably effective way for some species. It has to be the right, you know, not all species will, will respond uh, by making uh, roots in their stems like this, but uh, some will. And I'm providing this resource of nurseries for native plants uh, in Massachusetts and uh, native plant seed sources uh, throughout New England, uh, because uh, not only can you get what you're looking for, you can also get advice from these uh, nurseries, they, they have a lot of experience. They know which plants will work with your particular conditions. And uh, I, I do want to encourage you to uh, be aware of your, in, in when you're thinking about a, uh, your, your landscape and what you want to plant where, you need to be aware of how much, uh, how much sun there is, how much soil moisture, whether it's wet or dry or in between. Um, you might want to know about the pH or the soil texture, you know, whether it's excessively clay or excessively sandy. Uh, and all those conditions then would be useful information for, uh, for the person at the nursery who's helping you to decide what to plant there. Uh, here's another resource, the Tower Hill Hort Line in, in uh, Worcester, the Tower Hill Botanical Garden. Uh, you can call that phone number or send an email to that email message, email address. Uh, if you include a plant photo, uh, if, and if you're trying to identify a plant, for example, or if you have a sick plant and you're wondering what's happening, that photo will help them give uh, help you uh, help them give you uh, pointers of, of how to uh, how to proceed. Consider joining a garden club to learn more about plants. 
sharing information, sharing plants themselves. And garden clubs need to be in the forefront of this movement for uh, planting uh, native plants. Befriend gardeners for, the, for similar reasons. Uh, collaborate and celebrate. You might have a work day and invite people over and, and feed them well and, and they'll get to know each other and they'll uh, perhaps they'll, they'll go home with some of your extra plants and, uh, and you'll all be uh, you know, connected in that way and, uh, and be able to offer each other extra plants and, and uh, seeds and, and just you know, sharing the knowledge and, and, uh, and sharing, uh, celebrating each other's uh, habitat that you're created. Invite children to be stewards of nature. Uh, we need them to be activists because it, the, the, the earth depends on people who have that relationship to the environment. All decisions must maximize the welfare of the unborn unto the seventh generation. This is the, uh, the great binding law of the Iroquois Confederation. We need to be thinking about not only our children, but their children and their children and on unto the seventh generation with each a major decision or even the minor decisions that we make in terms of what we buy and, and whether it's contributing to the climate crisis or, uh, uh, or contributing to the pollution or contributing to the uh, pesticide use. So uh, as consumers, we have considerable leverage uh, in determining what, what happens out there. Uh, there's no limit to what we can do together. So, so start where you are and thank you for doing your part. Uh, thank you for joining me and uh, happy gardening.